We are back at RX-17. It's Lou McCoy joining you for another special guest. It's my honor and my pleasure to be sitting next to kind of a living legend today, Mr. George Banky from Mirage ULR. How are you today, sir? So far, so good. Hit. It's been a long weekend, hasn't it? But we've had a lot of fun. Yes, we have. I hope these guys have learned a lot. Uh, I've never taken a long-range class before, but I can't imagine anybody delivering this much information in this short of a period. Yeah, it takes a while. After you've uh, been around a while, you, you kind of accumulate most of this information. Some of it falls by the wayside. Some of it you retain. At least you know it's there, and if you need to use it, you can pull on it. Yes, sir. And you have been around a while, George. You said you turned 71? Yes, sir. 71 years old tomorrow. Well, happy early birthday, sir. And you look damn good for your age, too. Well, thanks a lot. And <clears throat> I work at it pretty hard. Well, it's paying off for you, sir. Uh, you are the <clears throat> manager, creator, what, what's the proper word? I'm one of the partners in uh, Mirage. There are two of us. I do most of the design work on uh, chassis and uh, design the uh, uh, suppressors and uh, um, most of the engineering in general. I do the bulk of it. Then uh, I'll build most of the originals and uh, then I turn them over to the, the guys that uh, do the CNC work and they'll set it up on master cam and um, <clears throat> build all the parts and uh, then we assemble everything of course and test it out uh, we have uh, um, uh, Brian that uh, uh, he's the master cam the computer wizard uh, he can <laughs> this guy is amazing what he can do with the computer and the CNC machines uh, we, uh, we have Christy and uh, Christy is our paint girl she can do amazing things with uh, the Serica, and does. And um, Bob, he's my partner, and he runs everything else and, uh, and leaves me alone most of the time, and it works out pretty good. <laughs> Sounds like you've got a good working relationship with the whole team. Yes, we do. We all get along really well and work good together. And it becomes a big family, kind of like this here. You can just feel it. It's more than a community. It feels like a big family at the end of the day. Yeah, everybody gets along really well and doesn't seem like anybody's getting their toes stepped on. And, uh, you know, most of us, we don't worry about that anyway, but uh, uh, it just seems to be flowing along really good. It's a beautiful thing to see it all in action and everything come together like this. Uh, can you tell us... How long has Mirage ULR been around? How long have you guys been doing this? We've been doing it about six years now uh, to where we actually uh, uh, have officially been in business doing it. I've been doing it a lot longer than that. Uh, Bob came out of the oil business and he's a, a long time shooter. And um, I uh, came out of the oil business as well and uh, have, was shooting all along. I've never stopped. And, uh, and I, I just uh, knew that it could go other places, uh, you know, using some good basic uh, engineering and looking at what we're doing and trying to improve it. I, I didn't seem to get much response from uh, other people in the industry that uh, built chassis and all. And so we just said, well, hey, we're just going to use some of our basic skills and uh, we're going to create some new equipment that's just flat out better. And your equipment is not only better, it's beautiful. Those, those, uh, the chassis that you build are breathtaking, sir. Well, thank you very much. A lot of the, you know, I'm a, I'm a German. My family came from northern Germany. And uh, I've, uh, I've inherited what you'd call uh, German traits. I'm not much on uh, aesthetics. If you build it and it functions perfectly and or, or properly and it uh, does what you want it to do and it does a great job, well, however that looks is 
is good for me. I mean, that's great aesthetics. It's about functionality at the end of the day. Yes, if it's if it's totally functional, uh, I mean, it, it looks great at that time as far as I'm concerned. Now, a lot of people like to see it have a little bit more CDI. You know, that's the Chicks Dig It area. And uh, that's the, uh, the, the Hollywood stuff or the uh, Ninja Mall, you know, whatever you want to call all that stuff. So you can employ a little bit of a tactical, I mean, pardon me, you can employ a, a little Italian uh, design in it, you know, and that'll slick it up a little bit. And, and you know, I hate, you know, I don't mind if I step on these guys' toes, but, you know, all the guys with the gold chains, they'll like it a little better then. I, I don't really hit it off with them so, uh, so well, but uh, I don't care anyway. Well, yeah, not only that uh, German need for functionality, you've also got that old German work ethic. And uh, I, I come from German heritage, too, and that's something that gets in your blood and kind of gets you ahead of the pack, it seems. Sometimes it does. Uh, you, you know, it depends on where you're going. So much today just depends on uh, how it looks and how cool it is and and so on and so on. And Hollywood's dictated a lot of that. Of course, that's the land of unicorns and rainbows. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just not a, a, a realistic thing. From when, when the guys are... Uh, our service guys and our SWAT guys and our, our, our police departments and all are crawling around and, 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 and doing what they do. Uh, you know, they're not really worried about what they're looking like, you know, at that time, and, and neither am I. But at the same time, I like to provide something for the hunter or the average guy that that wants to be cool so we have to we have to come up with something that 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 does have some aesthetic value and uh and so you know we'll kind of rub it a little bit here or there every now and then but i'm not the one that does that part of it <laughs> well that's why you've got such a good team behind you sir uh rex was telling me earlier that some of your chassis have been featured in hollywood movies well i'm i'm not gonna really go into that okay we'll leave that out if you want George uh, what was the inspiration to redesign the chassis where where did uh, the need for that come from well when you figure out what's going on with the rifle and 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 you look at the uh, what's significant and you know of course hitting the target is what's significant but we looked at having control of our shot and basically recoil management. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things, the, the, the twist, uh, uh, the BC of the bullet, and so on and so on. And, you know, you can go on with all that stuff. But one of the big things that was lacking big was your, your ability to control your, uh, your, your recoil. And with the, the present-day rifles, I mean, to this day still, largely, the, the rifles are built with a fulcrum designed into the rifle from the very beginning. So you're shooting to the, the hop on the thing every time you shoot. And <clears throat> rather than address it from a, a physics point of view, um, it's been band-aided. And they do it by weight and trying to hold things down. And, and, and that's just not the way to do it when you could uh, pull things up on the center line, basically get rid of it, and uh, then you could focus on other things, like what happens with your barrel twist and all, especially on the big guns, because the big guns have a, <clears throat> with a tight twist, will have a, a little bit more uh, movement in the, in the barrel. The small guns don't do that, like sixes and six fives and like that, they, they don't move much. I really enjoyed your presentation earlier this morning, especially the way you just framed it all and structured everything and talking about the uh, history of the rifle and back in the 14th century and uh, the Chinese and taking three guys to operate a, a, a single tube and they shot out 50 yards. You, you put it all into an historical perspective and it's mind-blowing the progress we've made just in the last couple decades. It's been exponential progress and growth well 
you might want to edit part of that because actually the growth of the rifle has been really slow. Uh, you take, for example, then I went in and I explained the business of the fractal, which is something that most people don't even know what it is. You wouldn't have any of this stuff right here this small and work the way it does without fractal. Well, when it was first introduced, it was thought to a classical uh, physicist thought it just had no practical use. And they would argue that point. It's like the naysayers always come out anytime anything new is done. So it's taken 50 years for it to come around. Uh, okay, that's only 50 years. That's pretty doggone good progress in this society before it came to life and now it's in every single thing there is that's an electronic. Well, the rifle had the fulcrum designed into it when they built the first really good chassis in the 14th century. Well, here we are in 2017 and most of the rifles are still built with the fulcrum, the same as it was in the 17th century. I mean, what, kind of, what is it that guys don't get? Yeah. Like you said before, it's because the average consumer doesn't know any better and we keep buying it. That, that is exactly correct. We're not looking down the barrel anymore to get the site. We've got these nice things we spend a lot of money on called scopes. I don't like rolling my head over to try and get behind one of those things because somebody thought it should be down close to the barrel. Scope doesn't care where it is. You know, it's a good idea to have it in line with the barrel in some ways, but then you can, you know, you can move it uh, up and down 50, 60, 100 minutes, whatever you want to do, 200 minutes. We build rails that are 40, 50, 60, uh, 80, uh, 100, 120, 150, 200, and 250 uh, minutes of angle. And we build quite a few of them. There are, the, the long range stuff is really taking off. And, and what, for a lot of guys, they just zero out at a thousand. I know one of my rifles is zeroed out at a thousand. I don't even, I don't even think about shooting it below a thousand yards. And I take off at a thousand and I roll it on up to, uh, 3,000, 32, 3,300 yards, something like that. Like you were saying earlier, the two or the mile shot has become the new thousand yard shot. Yes, that's exactly correct. And uh, around here in Texas, I don't know about the rest of the country, but in Texas, uh, and and you know I should say Texas and Oklahoma because uh, the Oklahoma boys are hot into it as well, and I. I don't, the, the guys that can shoot a thousand yards around here are into the thousands. And, and there, I would say there are, I, you know, I, I couldn't say, but I, I would say that the mile sh shooters in the state of Texas are into the thousands as well. Now we've got ranchers. I, I can come up with, I can come up with a, a half a dozen ranchers pretty quick that are mild shooters with 338s and uh, the new 7 millimeter bullets and and uh, oh, uh, uh, 300 Narmas and like that. They're, they're all over Texas and uh, they're uh, uh, <laughs> and most of them are pretty good. I'm amazed that whenever we go out to West Texas to shoot with those guys and and the, the old horseshoer has all bent over and our old buddy Edwin he, he's been run hard and put away wet, and uh, and that sucker can get down behind a 338 Lapua, and and he can smoke you at a mile with no trouble at all. It's really mind blowing when you see the the emergence of the passion for this sport and this craft, because 10, 20 years ago, long range shooting it wasn't in the public eye at all. You, you're right, and now, after the guys get to where they're really proficient at shooting a thousand yards, I told my partner when he started, and he got on to shooting a thousand yards because he was shooting with me really quick, and it got to where he was busting clays at a thousand yards pretty regular, and I told him, I said, Bob, you're going to get pretty bored with shooting these clays at a thousand yards. 
I said, you're going to have to come up with something else. You're going to have to move on. And so uh, that's what he's done. And last time I shot with him, we had a two-foot target, 3,000 yards. He was shooting his 375, and I was shooting my 338. And uh, third shot, he hit the target with his 375, dead center, 3,000 yards. Third shot on target. And uh, and he's, you know, he's just gotten to where he's a good shooter. And... Uh, and he can shoot all the distances with two or three different rifles, um, uh, you know, in between. Of course, we hadn't, we're not, we work the long shot and we work, we work with other people and sponsor people that, that are shooting two miles and beyond, actually three miles. I want to elaborate on that but it's it's we're there now we're just not there as solid as we'd like to be uh you know you can do the las vegas thing like it's been done over and over and where the guy shoots at the target 60 times and he finally hits it and like i said the odds are better in las vegas you know on the slot machine you know you're finally going to hit we've got guys that can show up on a two mile course and a two mile target and they can hit the two mile target. And, and I'm talking a small target, like 36 inches or so. And they can hit that three out of five times, which is pretty good. It's amazing. It, it blows my mind, actually. Yeah, on a class A day, you can do that. And then you can actually even roll it on out beyond. But the equipment that it takes to do that is uh, equipment that most people will uh, uh, they'll probably never even see it and you certainly won't see it anywhere around Bass Pro or, or Cabela's it's not something they keep around and uh, the equipment that most of the guys are going to buy in general are capable is capable of 3,000 yard shots you, you can get up to that with you know standard uh, copper coated or copper uh, and lead bullets uh, after, when you start pushing it out after that, your equipment gets to be a little bit more specialized and as you're going to be running uh, uh, hard copper bullets, probably tighter twist, bigger cases, you're going to be running it fast and your barrel life is not going to be real good. Um, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, it may as well be a different sport as far as that's concerned. Reading, reading the wind is, yeah, you make your best guess and everything. Uh, and but in the end you you make your best guess and you send it over there and you see where it goes and and then you can probably uh, uh, make some adjustments off that and and you uh, provided the winds not too bad you you'll probably do pretty good uh, of course now with applied ballistics uh, and some of the other programs uh, the elevation doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. We can we can get in the ball game pretty quick with uh, these programs. The guys that use it all the time are really good at it. It's amazing to me what they can do. And it's amazing to me just the the, the way the technology evolves and so quickly. And you've been shooting for many decades, sir, and you've seen a lot of changes in the industry and technology over your lifetime. Where do you think it's going to go in the future? What uh, What do you envision the technology doing in the next five or ten years, George? You know, I I, I don't even. I, I, I it's it's hard to speculate on that. Um, I can see in the next few years that. Uh, you know, you can sh make long shots. It's I, I question how useful it is for anything. It, it's that part of it's just a sport. But let's kind of put it into perspective. How how could you use it, and and how it could be used, and the demand for it is going to be the big driver and what pushes it forward. Of course, on scopes are gonna get better, your programs are gonna get better. Uh, all those things are gonna uh, evolve. 
uh, hopefully over a period of time. Um, I think that the rifles are, are going to evolve and get to be a, and I, I, I could I actually could be more specific on how the rifle can evolve. I'm not really going to go into that, but let's talk about the uh, uh, usefulness. You know, you've got your hunters and, you know, they're trying to hunt farther and farther out and they need to learn how to make what we call command shots and it's professionally done on a regular basis with professional shooting people and I, I mean people shooting soft targets let's just leave it at soft targets okay um, what what happens like with the police department and uh, the SWAT people let's say usually within the city limits of any city they're going to have a that's a big enough area they're going to have a, a, a SWAT team and they're going to have the SWAT snipers and all of that well what the, the snipers have to do there is is walk a pretty tight line they have to ask permission to shoot 200 yards but they don't shoot beyond 200 yards the general police sniper is going to shoot 80 yards maximum in general. Most of the time, 50, 80, maybe 90 yards in general. That's the work that they do. and that's, They're also restricted, and this is in all the major cities in the state of Texas, or in the United States for that matter. They, um, uh, generally, they're all using the 308. Uh, now, here's the big gig. We've hired all these guys. We're going to let them be snipers. We're going to let them take these real close shots. But we're going to limit them on the equipment. And this is the truth. We're going to limit them on the equipment that they're going to try and save people's lives with. And, and this equipment is not that expensive. Uh, boy, we've got some real geniuses making decisions relative to that, I'll tell you. Uh, this guy's sitting up there with his uh, basic Remy rifle, and he's got a some kind of inexpensive scope on it, and that's because all the that's all the uh, department could afford to buy, and and he's going to make his best shot. Fortunately, these boys practice enough to where they get pretty good with it, and they do a pretty good job. They could do a lot better. Now, here in Texas. It's a little different deal here. These guys have a little bit more to deal with than uh, what the other states do uh, in general. And basically it's down on the border dealing with the cartel and, and some of the different things around the state. Some of the, te there, there are teams in Texas that can do things that most places, most states, don't even think of and they take care of business on the borders that could only be taken care of the way they do it when you get into uh, a firefight on the border with uh, with the uh, cartel which has happened more than once even though we're lied to about how safe the border is down there uh, let me tell you for a fact a our president has got it right. What happens is, is the normal people come up to the border and they see the wall. They just stop. The cartel, you know, and those guys just turn around and go somewhere else because they're, they're done. But the cartel, they'll look around and they'll do tunnels and different things like that. But quite frankly, we've got that covered too. And, and now since the boys are empowered down there, uh, look at how all of it's dropped off dramatically, all of it. The, the cartel is working harder to push drugs. They're having to come up with new means to do that. And uh, hopefully we're staying on top of it. And we, you know, uh, I, I talk about all that. It's because when we have to take care of business and our boys do have to shoot rifles, they have to make shots they know they're going to make. Right now, we've got guys, and I'm not going to say what rifles they use or anything like that. They can make what we call a command shot 
1,420 yards, and they can take care of about any soft target at that distance. And I mean, show up as long as it's in a Class A condition, and that means when things are relatively good, a Class B, you probably wouldn't try the shot. Uh, and now you might if you had a backup sniper to where you were piggybacking and uh, and and he's he's waiting for your shot so that he can he can uh, uh, come in with a second shot instantly uh, because he's read your shot and you got the same dope in the guns well anyway uh, the, these guys uh, they can show up they can read the elements they uh, They've already, they're on top of it as far as, uh, uh, as far as uh, getting all the dope right in their gun, and they're gonna, they're gonna get it done immediately. What it means is, is they're gonna hit first shot. There's no doubt. They're gonna show up. They're gonna show up and bust clays instantly at a thousand yards and uh, it's it's and they work to do it they shoot three four or five days a week our, our our governor is a good governor he backs everything that we do here and um, and it's it's going to pay off and it's going to keep our state safe and the rest of the country for that matter yeah and the rest of the and the rest of the country that's exactly right because you know it's all basically we're doing all the work right here, and uh, it's no walk in the park. I can't imagine what it's like to see and do some of the things that you've done and seen in your life, sir. And uh, it's really just an honor to sit down and speak with someone of your presence and your experience. That's not too distracting back there, is it, George? You know. Oh, Rex, he can go on forever, can he? <laughs> you turn that guy loose, and uh, you, you, the first day he was a little nervous when he got up there. You can see today and yesterday he's getting into his zone. He's in the groove, and you look at him up there, and he's just having the time of his life. It's like he was born for this. Yeah, he's uh, he's quite a guy. He's he's really good at it. He, as a matter of fact, he's the best guy I have seen at it yet. And, and, and on top of that, he's just a good guy. I've known Rex for quite a few years, probably seven, eight years, and uh, he, he's just one virtuous dude. Like, uh, you will not meet anybody more honest or just true to what they believe in. And seeing all these people that show up for this event, it really, it really reassures just... Uh, the whole community because this feels like more like a family the more time we spend together it's one one big family and it's uh it's just amazing all the patriots that come out and want to support each other and want to learn from each other and share their information and experience and it's uh it's just an incredible team that we've assembled here it really is what do you see for rex in the future do you think he could do this full time i i would hope so I certainly would hope so, and I, I'm, I'm hoping you can put enough of this together and we can get enough interest around the country to where, you know, for me, for me right now, for our little business, uh, quite frankly, you know, just straight up, for our business, it's really good. So, you know, from that standpoint alone, I really like what he does. And, uh, but from the standpoint of guys having a lot of fun, and doing something they want to do. And you know, it's the, the camaraderie. It, it's, it's good, it's hard, hard to find. And it makes people happy, and I'll tell you what, it makes our country safer as well. We need to uh, kind of readjust how we think about things a, a lot, in my opinion, in our country. And, um, I am not so sure that it's creating anything new. It's maybe we ought to look at some of the uh, the older values that that have been around and structure, and using a few things like basic respect and uh, having uh, uh, 
respect for people and that you you help old people and, and helpless people and I mean not people that are just looking for a free gift for, for something for nothing uh, anyway I, I could I can go on and on I, we we've been in the last few years we have been lied to so much and it's obvious uh, and and quite frankly, you know, people are, a lot of people are under a president. <laughs> well, you know, it, it wouldn't matter if it was President Trump. Anybody that tried to do the right thing would be hammered the way he is. And because the right thing right now is not going to be real popular with all those other folks. And then, of course, too, see, they're going to tell you that's a matter of opinion. Well, <laughs> come on. You know, there's a lot of people with opinion around the country <laughs> and uh, and in the world. And, you know, when it comes down to, they're like, well, our opinion is the only one that counts. And uh, <laughs> now I'll tell you this, out here in Texas, you go out to West Texas or East Texas, well, going from one place to the other to start with is like getting on a spaceship and flying to a different planet. And uh, but there's one thing that they all have in common. Most of them are shooters, and they're all good people. Uh, you don't. You can go out to a, an event in West Texas, and there will be thousands of people somewhere. Nobody tries to shoot anybody. Nobody does anything dumb. But I will promise you, out in all those pickup trucks. They are well armed, all of them, right now, and and that's just the way it is. Uh, and you have somebody that's real liberal come in, try and tell them how to change their lives and what to do, and try and take their guns and stuff. And these these guys, they will put up with it, and uh, and that's the way it is. And you, it's not going to happen. This country was founded upon independence and hard work, and. Anybody in this room today, they, they know for a fact that those principles are the foundation of what makes us and makes this country great. And it's just, uh, this gives me a lot of faith in the future, knowing that there's this many patriots out there that want to come together to try to keep this country great and try to keep those values true for all of us. And uh, if you watch the news anymore, George, it, it, it's really kind of a dystopian negative world that they portray but this events like this it it reinstates my faith actually you know I I have a good friend that works in Afghanistan he's home on leave and I just spent some time with him he was telling me that the people in Afghanistan love Donald Trump they think he is wonderful this is the average person that lives and works and they just think he's wonderful and 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 his election has empowered those people to stand up and want to do better and go forward and try and because the way it was they didn't but they do now he has given them uh, it's not that he sent them money it's just they like how he thinks and what he wants to do and which way he wants to go and uh, you know that's what our country was built on it was based on that yeah, doing uh, creating that kind of an atmosphere to, and 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 so consequently our boys that work there now are well liked well the other guys like Taliban and I guess it's what Hezbollah and uh, some of those other ones they're all trying to uh, be like Isis now and uh, of course our guys that guys are having to deal with all that and um, you know the prerequisite which I in my opinion should just be to get rid of the cancer simple as that I mean whatever it takes just get it done and stop fooling around about it turn or you know our boys tell us I talk to them pretty regularly and they say hey we can get it done just let us do it and uh, uh I, it's pretty simple to me, but of course, you know, all our do-gooders and all their compassion and everything, you know, how about, 
how about Americans? I mean, why not? You know, nobody's jumping through hoops to help us, you know. But, it, you know, you talk about compassion. Why didn't somebody look at us with a little compassion it, <laughs> at the same time? You know, there's nothing wrong with compassion. There's nothing wrong with helping people if you do it in a constructive way. Just like there's nothing wrong with hard work and independence and building yourself and everybody else up around you. Because it's, uh, it's contagious is what it is. If you go out and you're a positive person and you try to spread good, it multiplies. But if you go out and you do the same thing with negativity, it has the same effect, but in the opposite direction. And it's just, it, it's interesting, the two sides and how we try to, uh, we try to change them both into something that they aren't. But at the end of the day, we're all Americans, you know, and we're all in this together. And rather than a culture of divisiveness, we, we can still try to pull everybody together, I think, but by not giving people handouts but by teaching them the values of hard work and independence and lifting themselves up from whatever their plight might be i you know we can talk about all this stuff to the end of the earth you know i look at I, i've looked in all the science and or pardon me i've looked in all the the history since since the earliest times i've followed it a human life on earth. Genghis Khan was responsible for 60 million deaths. Uh, it, him alone. They say that the genes from the mongrels from that period uh, are still in, let me see, they still exist in 1 in 20 today. Yeah, because of how many women were raped while he was in in power pretty amazing in one small in one town not a small town in china and this is just history stuff you know that uh, uh um 60,000 women committed suicide rather than be raped by mongols and that's a historical fact and these kinds of things, it, Hitler was nothing. He was just another guy that came up with the idea to kill a whole bunch more people. And he just picked the Jews, you know. It, at the time, it was not their day. Uh, in, in any case, uh, then you've got Russia, and I, Lord, I can't think of how many million were killed up there at, at one point at what, 17 million, and then it goes on and on and on and on and people are, are are killed in conflicts all the time it's just the way things have been in this world and there's nothing that the hollywood crowd is going to be able to do to stop it it's going to go on and it's going to go on and it's going to go on whether we like it or not it'll go on until we learn to be better i think because that's the thing about history if we don't learn from it we are doomed to repeat those mistakes over and over and over and over but i'd like to think call me an optimist george i'd like to think that someday we might get our crap together and humankind could just get along we, we could have a garden of eden on earth if we all wanted it but uh i don't know war is just more fun it's more profitable i guess yeah too many people want to be in charge and look at me and you know it's the, the old debutante ball deal you know and uh I, I like the uh, I like Star Trek and uh, you know the way those people lived and worked and you know it, it was kind of a socialist society and all but people don't necessarily want to get out and be so greedy and everything unfortunately that kind of deal doesn't seem to be able to uh, exist and uh, you've always got somebody coming up now that you know you got all the different religions and I <laughs> Uh, boy, religion is, uh, you know, it's the big driver on why I even do what I do or my friends do what they do or why they exist. And when I say my friends, uh, my friends in the defense community, you might say, or law enforcement or whatever. You know, the guys that wrote the Bible wrote it 400 years after the death of Jesus Christ. Not that I don't believe in Jesus Christ, because I do. But 
not like what most of the churches and the, the religious organizations are pushing out there. And I, I like to look at it from the standpoint of uh, science and looking into uh, uh, the, the reality of it. And if you, anyone that goes in and studies uh, physics and, and quantum physics and uh, things like this, will have a different outlook on everything. Once you go into it, you will never look at every anything the same again. Never. Changes everything. It changes everything. And, and the, the deeper you get into the science uh, of it in quantum physics, you realize then, as all scientists, including Einstein, Borg, uh, 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 Born, and most of those guys, far and away, say there is a master architect. And they refer to the master architect as God many times. And, and there's, you know, they get into the DNA and the, all the, the mapping, the, the neurons, the protons, uh, the axons, and all the business of science. And you realize that, <laughs> that there's, sure enough, God's out there because this didn't just fall out of a tree, all this stuff. And all the mapping to all the different things and the creatures and, and all that exist. And, um, you know, if we were not, uh, you know, then you realize that, yes, there's a God, but all these religions, all this stuff that's man-made that's trumped up and people want to kill people over it. What? What's wrong with these people? Come on, they need to, you know, they've been given a, a mind uh, to think with and, and then want to believe a, a bunch of just stuff that's just not the way it is. I feel like we could have this conversation for days, George. <laughs> uh, it's, you raise a lot of good points there, sir, because life is way too significant and dynamic and complex just to be some random fart from the middle of nowhere that came out of nothing like th this is all way too significant to not have any meaning behind it and the capabilities of mankind and our brains and just all the power we have as individuals and then collectively as people put together it's uh it's empowering once you realize all that and then you throw in the re religious dynamic to it and all these religions have been hijacked and they've got some sort of sinister agenda but if you look at it it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian whether you're a Muslim if you believe in Buddhism we all believe that there was a creator right and it doesn't matter what name you give him he she it made us all and whether whether or not we want to admit all of our differences at the end of the day we're all in this together pretty much we're all in it together there's no question and you're just going to have to deal with it and uh, um you know we spend this is all a long ways from uh shooting soft targets you know but um this has been the quickest hour of my life, by the way, George. I can't believe we've been doing this almost an hour, sir. Yeah, believe it or not. Um, I've got two more questions for you off the top of my head. Uh, what advice do you have for anybody that might be listening to the show or watching the show? Uh, young people out there, anybody that's got questions about the world or their place in it or trying to find their path in life, somebody who might not quite see the way yet do you have any advice for them sir you know i don't know if some people will ever see the way you know my dad made a profound statement to me one time uh, and he was he had just retired like he was early like 62 or 63 and he says he says you know george he says you know I'm, I'm 62 years old and I still don't know what I want to do. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, and it's stuck with me for a long, long time. And I see kids uh, that are coming along. I have a, a friend of mine 
who's a ski instructor um, in 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 Lake at Lake Tahoe, and she's a good gal. She was one of my students when I was a a, a race coach uh, for ski racing. Well, she um, she has a degree. Her parents have degrees. They're go getters, and uh, and she is too. She's really talented. And she just cannot find what she wants to do. And I told her, I said, well, you just keep on skiing because you may never know, but you'll bump into something along the way that you like to do, and you just pursue doing it and sticking with it. And it might not be, and, it, and if you're just motivated by money, you'll never be happy. And uh, so just find something you want to do and do it and, and try and make a living doing it. And... Uh, and that's all there is, really, in the end, is you just have got to pick something that you like or that you uh, that you have fun with. I, in my lifetime, I, I've done pretty well, but I never pursued one thing actually for the money. I did it because I wanted to do it. I liked it, and I saw that it, it might yield something along the way if I do it right and get good with it. And you know that's just my perspective. Is it the right one? It's, it's I, I have my friends that would disagree, and I'm sure there are a lot that will. But you know it's the way it is. I don't care. I've had a good time. You know I've I've been in I've I've ski raced. I've raced cars and motorcycles and go karts and. Uh, uh, and had businesses relative to all that. I've been in the oil and gas business, the manufacturing business, the home building business, built bridges, docks, boats. Man, I've built some stuff, a lot. And that's a fact. And I've had a good time doing it. I had a good time with all that. And uh, you just gotta get out there and go after it. And you know, Learn how to be in the barnyard. And what I mean by that is, is when you step into the barnyard, you know you're going to have to step around a pile every now and then. And just learn to do it and get on down the road. And uh, I, I don't know how to tell it any other way. <laughs> That's beautiful, George. Uh, I got one more question for you today, sir. Do you have any advice for Rex and for his future and for what he wants to do? I'll tell you, Rex just needs to keep on doing what he's doing. He's trying to do good, and if it works, you know, it, it's if he, it, it's going to take promotion and keep doing He's already well-known, and he'll get better and better and better, and, and you just you don't know where it's going to lead. It's like on the way to the forum. You, you really don't know where you're going to end up. You started out to go to one place and, and but you bumped into so many things along the way that uh, you don't know where you're gonna what uh, where you're gonna end up you don't know who you're gonna meet somewhere you don't you, you just don't and and it happens all the time I've met people here that I'm gonna do business with and they said you're the guy that we wanted to talk to and uh, and if I hadn't have come I wouldn't have known that's how I'm sorry go ahead um, Rex has just got to keep doing what he's doing he's got a dream or he's got a focus and he's just got to keep doing it is it going to be just a rocket ship explosion uh, uh, successful who knows you don't know you just got to line up and get in the race and try you know, a year ago we started this podcast, George, and this whole thing here was a pipe dream. This was just, uh, it was like some reality that didn't even exist yet, and less than a year later, it's manifested itself, and now I find myself sitting down with, uh, with a man who's got more wisdom than I can possibly absorb at one time, and uh, you, you just... Uh, this is a hell of an interview, sir. I just want to thank you for everything. 
this won't be the last time that you guys do this. This is the best thing that we, I have seen or been associated with thus far in this this industry. This is really good. Uh, I think that the guys have learned a lot about this on uh, relative to the topics and how to handle it at the next one that they do. I expect that the next one will be better and better and better. And I think that the guys that go to it are going to uh, benefit and learn a lot. Absolutely. Mr. George Banke from Mirage ULR, thank you so much for joining us today at RX17 on the Rex Reviews podcast and also on Rex's YouTube channel. It's been an honor and a pleasure, sir. Thank you. Hey! Hey!